On this week's edition of New York Now, summer's here and the time is right to enjoy the outdoors, but some activities like boating can unwittingly spread invasive species. We'll look at what the state of New York and you can do about it. And cannabis is coming. We talked to Alan Gandelman about growing New York's first legal batches of recreational marijuana. And we'll dig into this week's news with Grace Ashford of the New York Times and Zach Williams of the New York Post. I'm Casey Seiler, and this is New York Now. Today, the Senate majority will pass legislation. I will fight like hell for you every single day, like I've always done and always will. Maybe get another stand. Welcome to this week's edition of New York Now. I'm Casey Seiler, editor of the Times Union, in for Dan Clark. Summer is in full swing, and that means millions of people will be heading out to the Adirondacks and enjoying lakes and waterways across the state. But all of that travel and fun can increase the spread of invasive species, threatening the health of the natural environment we all enjoy. As anyone who has ever stepped on a zebra mussel can tell you, once invasive species take hold, they are exceptionally hard to combat. New York State is using all the tools it can to reduce and, more importantly, prevent the spread of invasive species. But we all have a part to play. New York Now's Thomas Connolly has this report. Take a look. When it comes to the economics of invasive species, it almost always hits at the local level. That's where the costs are the highest. So in many ways, we're paying for invasive species. And that's really where our wildlife habitat and our human environment come together. By the time the general public notices invasive species in their own backyards, it becomes extremely difficult to eradicate them. Spongy moths, which were formerly known as the gypsy moth, really bring invasive species home to people. They're a, an invasive insect that is cyclical, so we haven't had a serious infestation in over 20 years. However, when they do come, they certainly impact your environment because they are crawling all over the trees and they're dropping their fecal matter or frass also as they're chewing the leaves of your trees. They'll often first start eating on our oak trees and that can be a problem, but most of our oak trees can grow leaves back, and so they can withstand a year or two of having uh, a gypsy moth infestation. However, our conifers, or things like our pines and our hemlocks, they don't re-leaf as quickly. So last year, when the heavy infestation of spongy moth came to the Lake George region, it actually did kill off some of our pine trees and our hemlock trees. That has impacts for homeowners who need to potentially remove those trees. It impacts our timber industry and our wildlife habitat. This year by my house in Warrensburg, they are horrendous. They start out as small little um, caterpillars. So, and then they grow into really big caterpillars, kind of like the ones you see when they um, turn into butterflies, but they're nothing like butterflies and their poop is like um, black little pellets and it's all over and you could actually be out there and you feel it land in your hair. So you can't, I can't sit outside at all. For instance, today I have to mow my lawn desperately but I'm, I'm gonna be dressed from head to toe sweating because I don't want any of those things near me. There are different species that might impact our forests, some that might impact agriculture, some that might just be a nuisance and, you know, might, that people might really see in that way. Um, spongy moth is an example of something that we really see in our neighborhoods. We can understand it, you know, you're, you're stepping on them and um, you can really see what a nuisance it is in your neighborhood. So it's, it has that level of direct impact. In New York, we're super lucky. We have these amazing, beautiful lakes, like here right on Lake George. We have over 7,800 lakes. We have over 70,000 miles of streams in here, and they provide so many great benefits. Drinking water, recreation, agriculture, industry. And the problem is that aquatic invasive species are one of our three largest threats to those habitats, and they can cause ecological and economic harm. And so we really want to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to help protect these special places in New York. One of the issues that we have is that our canals, um, they are super highways for aquatic invasive species. They artificially connect watersheds that were not connected. And so that allows for plants and or organisms to move from one watershed to another watershed. Humans are the problem. We're the cause of aquatic invasive species 
because we are moving them from lake to lake or watershed to watershed. I think about it in terms of the mobility of the population. We're just so mobile. Right, so you can launch your boat over in the Connecticut River in the morning and it might have hydrilla in the river. And in the afternoon, you could take that same boat with just a little fragment of hydrilla hanging off the motor and launch it in Lake Champlain and inadvertently spread that species. You could have your camping trailer parked down in Pennsylvania, which is a hot spot for the spotted lantern fly, and then drive it up into Essex County where our beautiful orchards in the Adirondacks are and inadvertently certainly have carried that species. Unfortunately, Lake George is one of our more invaded lakes in the Adirondack region. It has six of the 16 species that the APIT program tracks. Um, these are things like Asian clam, uh, Eurasian water milfoil. Um, they've even had zebra mussels in here. And so it's really important that when people are coming or leaving from Lake George, that they practice clean, drain, dry because we don't want to have new invasive species come in here, and we also don't want to spread the invasive species from Lake George to other places. Not only is New York encouraging boaters to prevent the transfer of aquatic invasive species, they're requiring it. On June 8, 2022, the state legislature amended its environmental conservation law requiring boaters in the Adirondacks to obtain a certification that they have cleaned, drained, and dried their boat every time they enter a waterway. We inspected almost a quarter million boats in the state for aquatic invasive species. We intercepted more than 14,000 aquatic invasive species. This year, with our boat program really kicking into gear for the summer, we looked at more than 20,000 boats in just one week last week. So that's a really critical component to invasive species management. It's interesting, like we around here, everybody has to do a tick check, right? You've been outside, you come in, you do a tick check, it's similar. You come back from a hike, clean your boots. Come back from a paddle, clean your boat. Our freshwater ecosystems are some of the most imperiled ecosystems on the planet. Greater than 80% of plant and animal populations has decreased since 1970. We've also lost over 30% of the habitat. So these are critical places that provide so many benefits for clean water, drinking water, for carbon storage, for biodiversity, and they're really impacted. And one of the three largest threats to our freshwater ecosystems are aquatic invasive species. So these are really special places and we need to do all that we can to help protect them. New York State is so fortunate that New York invests in invasive species and has a system of partnerships for regional invasive species management all across the state. These partnerships, we call them PRISMs for short. There are eight of them in New York State that are funded through the state's Environmental Protection Fund and, co and organized through the Department of Environmental Conservation. When the public participates and knows about these issues, they can um, recognize uh, situations in their backyard, they can adjust their behavior, because the state can't be everywhere. You know, we address things that we can to, to within our ability, but, you know, it's a, it's a total community effort to try and address some of these issues. New York State has a great framework in place for invasive species, and there are a few places where that can be enhanced. So if you think about in New York State, there is a list, for instance, a law that prohibits the sale of certain invasive plants or regulates them. That list is created by the legislature, and it hasn't been updated in a number of years, and it's out of date, scientifically anyway. It's also the product of compromise, which is what all legislation is. So it may be the ornamental plant trade folks talking with the invasive species folks and trying to compromise on that. And what we really need to do is we need to bring more science into our legislative decision making to make sure that things like prohibited plants are based on science. For more information, New York State's Department of Environmental Conservation produced a documentary called Uninvited, the Spread of Invasive Species. You can find a link to watch that complete program at nynow.org. And now, I'm happy to be joined at the Reporters' Roundtable for a discussion of more of this week's news by Grace Ashford of The New York Times and Zach Williams from The New York Post. Thanks very much for coming in. So, at last, after two months of waiting, we have a request for proposals for an after-action report on the state's reaction to COVID-19. Uh, this has been something that lots of people on both sides of the aisle have been clamoring for 
What does the RFP kind of tell us about what the scope of that work by an outside private consultant is going to be, and what are the prospects for it to be substantial and, and you know, uh, taken well when it comes out? So the, uh, the scope is pretty wide-ranging. It's going to be looking at the state's uh, handling of uh, patients into congregate settings, which has obviously been you know, very, very big and contested. Um, it's going to be looking at some procurement questions. It's going to be looking at um, uh, the way that the state makes decisions about education, when to open uh, schools, um, you know, and down to uh, nursery schools. Um, I think the, the, the key question that you're sort of <laughs> uh, zeroing in on is, you know, will this be substantial? Will this be independent? Um, it is being handled, uh, you know, by the executive and then uh, I believe Jackie Bray over at the Division of Homeland Security and Emergency Services, um, who actually ran a good deal of the city's COVID response, is going to be overseeing it. Um, one thing that I thought was pretty interesting was that they, they are uh, eliminating from consideration anyone who has done work with the state during this COVID process, which is a lot of people. In including like heavy hitters like McKinsey and Company, yeah. which is problematic in all sorts of ways, but um, they of course worked on the Department of Health's nursing home report that came out in July of 2020 and was you know hugely controversial. So, so they are right out of that work. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I would just add that a key thing in the middle of this investigation is the gubernatorial election. Now, if, it if this RFP is for a one-year investigation, in the middle of it, we've got to see, will Kathy Hochul get reelected and this investigation will continue as she designed it? Or might Lee Zeldin stop this investigation, start his own? He has vowed to have his own investigation, and he says he might take or leave whatever Hochul might get going if he's lucky enough to win the November election, of course. Yeah, well, th th the big question is who is going to get selected to do it? Who are the investigators going to be? And mm -hmm. yeah, will the executive chamber be able to kind of keep its its mitts off the, the final work product? So um, we want to turn to Zach, a story that uh, you printed in the post looking at Kathy Hochul's uh, flights, her use of state aircraft, um, in specific, $170,000 uh, paid for by taxpayers, more than 100 flights between the end of August and the, and the end of March. So that $170,000 is a ballpark figure. We don't know exactly, um, not least because the governor hasn't released all of her public schedules detailing just how many flights. We do know it's at least 140, 131 hours in the air. And Hochul, like many governors before, both inside and outside New York, is being accused of abusing it either for her political benefit or her private benefit. I think one flight that really stuck out to me was a September flight just to see the Buffalo Bills home opener in Buffalo. She flew from New York City to Buffalo, saw the game, spent the night, and then flew right back to New York City early the next morning. And I think examples like that really challenge the idea that all of these flights in their entirety, as she has said, um, are just for official state business for the benefit of the taxpayer. The, the governor's initial response to this was to say, we're using the plane to um, connect with constituents, voters all across the state, as well as citizens. The use of voters, <laughs> one imagines, probably made her staff uh, groan a little bit, without a doubt. Yeah, Republicans jumped on that pretty quickly and said, she said the quiet part out loud. You know, of course, a lot of these flights were for legitimate, what it looks like, legitimate government business, press conferences, um, disaster briefings, meeting with other government officials. But we would also see, as a Times Union has reported um, months and months ago that, you know, she would also sprinkle in these private events, campaign events typically, so that she can make maximum, uh, take maximum advantage of all these different trips around the state. Um, uh, moving to Washington, D.C., there was a vote on uh, a bill that would uh, essentially uh, protect um, existing marriages, same sex, as well as interracial across the state, just on the chance that the Supreme Court decides to go after the Obergefell decision um, from 2015. Um, what was interesting about that is it got 47 Republican votes, um, including every member of the New York delegation, GOP delegation, except for Claudia Tenney from central New York. I was really struck by this. I, I thought this was pretty surprising. It's not so long ago that even mainstream Democrats were hesitant to voice their support. You know, notably Barack Obama as, in his first campaign, uh, you know, stopped short of saying that he supported gay marriage. So the fact that now 
Uh, there are a majority of New York uh, representatives from the Republican Party who are supporting this and who are saying, you know, I was wrong, um, you know, back then, even when they when they themselves voted against, uh, you know, New York's law is pretty interesting. At the same time, I don't think we should kid ourselves that the, you know, Republican Party has moved you know, hugely on this. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of <clears throat> transgender, uh, you know, bills that are being considered, and especially in the realm of health care for minors. Um, but it's certainly interesting in the, you know, c context of all of these other kind of culture war type issues that are happening, abortion um, and, uh, you know, access to contraception, uh, mostly. I think it's clear that the Republicans are feeling a little bit uncomfortable um, and considering these issues in the uh, upcoming elections. What's interesting with Claudia Tenney, the lone Republican in the state delegation who voted against this, was she kind of used a, an excuse similar to what other Republicans have said about abortion, that here in New York it's settled law, and she supports settled law, but that she won't proactively um, actually w vote to codify her actual beliefs. So she's trying to have it kind of both ways. She is in a district that is very red, um, a very red district at this point. So she's probably thinking more about potential vulnerabilities to her political right in a primary more than, you know, New York State voters' attitudes as a whole on this issue. We should note that uh, Claudia Tenney voted against marriage equality when she was a state assemblywoman as well. So mm. at least give her points for consistency on this. Um, we are talking Friday morning on Thursday evening out in Rochester. Lee Zeldin was accosted, attacked by a man who was uh, holding what is a, called a knuckle knife, um, basically sort of a two-pronged blade. Very scary scene that was, of course, caught on on video. Um, it, it's unclear at this point what this uh, man's motivation might have been, but at, at this point, sort of what's the state of play of how this is playing out politically? Thank goodness nobody was hurt. Well, this was a really strange situation, because just earlier in the day, the governor, at perhaps a, a attempt at humor, had um, released a spoofed version of Zeldin's public schedule that basically <clears throat> said, oh, he'll at this time, he'll talk about his vote against the 2020 election results, obviously something that he has been involved with, too much controversy, or that this and that. And then, lo and behold, hours later, um, somebody actually commits an act of violence at a Zeldin campaign event outside Rochester. Now, we don't know the person's motivation, um, but it was not a good look for the Hochul campaign that they had kind of, you know, said at least, you know, that he was having events at this time, they didn't give specific locations, but Republicans quickly kind of moved to draw a link between, again, this attempt at humor that she had and what happened to Zeldin, and I guess we'll just see how it plays out in the campaign. Right. Well, that's where we're going to have to leave it. So thanks very much to Grace Ashford of The New York Times. Please come back. And Zach Williams of The New York Post. Thank you. New York has legislated that recreational adult use cannabis will be available for sale in New York. But in order to sell cannabis, New York first needs to grow it. The regulatory roadmap for adult-use marijuana production and distribution is still being hashed out. But New York has already approved a select number of conditional cultivator licenses. This week, David Lombardo checked in with Alan Gandelman, president of the New York Cannabis Growers and Processors Association, to see where New York's budding cannabis industry stands. So thanks so much for joining us from your farm uh, office, Alan. Thank you so much for having me. So you already wear a lot of different hats. Uh, you're the president of the New York Cannabis Growers and Processors Association. Uh, you've got your own farm in, in upstate New York. Uh, but your resume is growing as you will now be serving on the state's uh, Cannabis Advisory Board. What's that board's mandate and what are your hopes for it moving forward? So the mandate of that board is really twofold, as I understand it right now. Uh, first thing is to look at all of the draft regulations that are starting to come out of the state in regards to cultivation, processing, dispensaries, et cetera, around the cannabis industries and make comments. Um, and the second mandate, which I think is the bigger mandate, and it's going to be years of work, is deciding how to reinvest the tax money. Uh, back into the communities around New York State that were most harmed by the war on drugs. And so there's 13 members of us uh, on that board. And if I remember correctly, 40% of the tax revenue gets diverted into this uh, com kind of community reinvestment program that our 13 members kind of decide what to do with. 
So while a lot of the rules and regulations are being crafted right now, it sounds like you're going to have work uh, to do into 2023 and beyond as revenue really begins to pick up most likely from the sale of marijuana. Yeah, exactly. Um, for this year, you know, we only just had our first meeting, which was really just an intro meeting. And after that, um, you know, hopefully we'll be meeting at least monthly or more. And probably the tax revenue won't come in until mid next year, I would guess. Uh, and that's where like kind of the next phase of what we're doing as a board would set into play. So you're one of about 220 hemp farmers in New York who've been granted conditional licenses to grow marijuana this summer so that when and if dispensaries open later this year, they have something to actually stock their shelves with. How is the growing season going so far for you? For me personally, the growing season is amazing. Uh, it's been a dry summer, but a really nice summer for growing cannabis. Our plants look fantastic, and we're going to have a really good, high-quality uh, crop this year. And I mentioned that more than 200 farmers have been greenlit to grow marijuana in New York, but we're a state of 19 million people. So when you think about the demand from adults that might pop up once dispensaries are uh, up and running, will we have enough crop to actually stock shelves for you know, more than a week? We'll have enough crop to stock shelves for more than a week. Uh, it might only be three to six months, though. Uh, it depends on how many dispensaries the state opens up. Um, even with all these 220 farmers, um, if you look at you know, what the state consumes in cannabis, it's probably millions of pounds a year. Um, and each farm can only grow up to one acre. So it's really uh, a good start, but it's not going to you know, satisfy the entire industry it's maybe going to satisfy 10% of the need. And so there's a lot of room left for more licenses uh, across the industry. Um, and, you know, that's where the state has to continue rolling out regulations and rolling out licenses, you know, but ultimately it's going to come down to how many dispensaries are there. This new $200 million fund is uh, available to start funding these uh, justice involved dispensaries. And so we're we're going to see how that rollout looks like over the next six to 12 months. Well, you mentioned the justice component of the dispensaries, which we'll be seeing come into action later this year. But there's also a social equity component to the growing of marijuana in New York. Can you talk a little bit about the mentorship program that's supposed to accompany the conditional licenses that were awarded to those 200 plus farmers? Yeah, absolutely. So part of the bill that the governor signed earlier this year creates uh, a mentorship program for people who want to get into the industry, who are most likely going to be social equity uh, cultivators so that they can pair up with an existing farmer um, or network of farmers and really learn how to uh, deal with a regulated industry. So there are a lot of legacy cultivators in New York State that have been growing for years. And so through the uh, mentorship program, you know, they don't need help learning how to grow cannabis. They know how to do that. But I think the things we could help with uh, are around the paperwork compliance, the seed to sale tracking system, you know, labor practices, you know, making sure you have employees on the books, um, all of the other things that are, you know, hard to do when you're dealing with a highly regulated industry. And finally, uh, the state's Cannabis Control Board recently approved final regulations that will govern the dispensaries that are supposed to open this fall. And you know, there's been a lot of attention paid to the fact that the initial applicants uh, will need to have uh, experience running a business and either have a marijuana conviction themselves or be related to someone who has a marijuana conviction. Anything else meaningful about these regulations that people should know, especially if they're interested in applying for a license to run a dispensary? Yeah, I think you kind of mentioned the, the biggest parts that no state in the country has done. And that is, you know, finding people that have some business experience and have been convicted or arrested uh, of a cannabis offense and not just themselves, but anyone in their immediate family, really trying to find the people that have been, you know, their families have been affected uh, by the war on drugs, not just themselves. So that's unique. Um, and the, uh, going above and beyond that, what's unique here that people should know is that there is a $200 million fund that New York State has to help people not only get their licenses, but actually find real estate locations, find those dispensaries, sign leases, and 
help them get into a storefront by the end of this year. Um, a lot of times what you see in other marketplaces is, you know, it's hard to find real estate. Landlords don't want to rent the dispensaries, or if they do, they're like charging exorbitant amounts for rent. And in this case, you know, New York State is really going to kind of step in and help to alleviate the risk um, so that people don't have to go out there and try to raise millions of dollars, float long-term leases, wait for the licensing to come in, et cetera. So, I mean, this is a really uh, fast track way to get uh, people into a business and up and running as soon as possible. Um, and so I think that's just something really unique and people have to kind of understand the state's role in this. It isn't just, you get a license and you're off on your own. It's like, you get a license and then here's a potential storefront for you to operate as your first one. And then in the future, if it's going well, you could open up you know, other storefronts uh, down the line. Well, we've been speaking with Alan Gandelman. He's the president of the New York Cannabis Growers and Processors Association and a member of the state's Cannabis Advisory Board. Alan, thank you so much for making the time. I really appreciate it. New York State is working to make legal adult use marijuana available for purchase by the end of the year, but there is a lot of work to do to hit that goal. We'll continue to follow the story. And that's all we have time for on this week's New York Now. Have a great week and be well. Funding for New York Now is provided by WNET.